So I, I want you to know, just everybody relax. Nobody's going to appear out of nowhere or come up the side. Or... No real props or anything. So when Rachel, my daughter, is a 20-year-old, my daughter Rachel, uh, came back from college and she said to me, so Dad, what do you want for Christmas? And I said, all right, this is what I want for Christmas from you. My Christmas gift is I want you to watch It's a Wonderful Life with me. And then we'll go out and get a bite to eat and we'll talk about it. She's like, sweet, this is really not going to cost me. <laughs> so, so we did that, right? We went to, uh, we saw It's a Wonderful Life, no cell phones, no nothing. We watched this movie. We go out to the restaurant, and I'm asking her, so what did you think? And she goes, yeah, I liked it. It was really good. I noticed how in the beginning part, they kind of like set you up. They show you all these little things that happen. They seem small, but yet in, in, later on, they became so transformative and powerful. He, remember, he saves his brother, Harry, from the pond. Uh, he doesn't deliver that medication that Mr. McGower Gower was going to send. It had poison in it. Uh, he gets martini, he gets, uh, gets him um, home, he gives him bread, uh, wine, and a little salt for flavor of life. All these little things that he did, even his Uncle Billy, uh, he kind of let him feel like, you know, he's in the part of this business and give him a sense of dignity. He was always like kind of giving of himself and doing things. And yet underneath it all, there was always that sense of he wanted to build skyscrapers and you know, big buildings and had all these plans. He wanted to leave Bedford Falls. And then all of a sudden he has this experience where Uncle Billy loses $8,000. Now, if you Google $8,000 in 1945, it's worth about $125,000 today. So imagine Uncle Billy with one hundred and twenty-five grand. And he puts it in the newspaper, and he's going back and forth, and he winds up handing the newspaper to Potter, and Potter takes the thing. Can you believe that son of a gun? <laughs> Knowing exactly where that money was and letting everybody suffer. <clears throat> and so he gets to the point where he's so stressed out, he's so worried and bothered about the problems in his life. He's in this drafty old house, and, you know, they come in there and, uh, you know, Hey, Daddy, the next door neighbor got a brand new car. What's the matter? Our car isn't good enough for you. <laughs> you know, how do you spell Frankenstein? What am I, a dictionary? Janie's playing Jingle Bells. Stop playing that stupid, silly song. He's all bothered. Because this $8,000 is lost. What is he going to do? Now he doesn't even want to live anymore. And then he has this experience, the divine, played by that angel Clarence. This, the divine experience comes in and he has this sense of what would life be like if he wasn't born. And he realizes all the things that he took for granted, all the things that he just overlooked, he didn't understand all the impact. Harry would have passed away. Harry wouldn't have saved all those guys on the transport. That little boy would have been poisoned. All these things that happened. And suddenly, the simple little thing of Zuzu's petals that he puts into his pants pocket becomes so important to him. <coughs> what, a little, what a dad would do for his little girl, right? You know, she's got her flower. And he's going to fix it for her. And he puts it into his hand's pocket. And suddenly, he comes back. He comes back into that house. Nothing's changed. He's still out eight grand. He's still going to jail. But he doesn't care. Because whoosh, he's transformed. He has a totally different experience of the same reality. And so Rachel and I are talking, and I say, you know, because like, I remember a couple years ago, she came here for Christmas Mass at night. And I thought, oh, this is great. You know, everybody's going to be here. She's going to see her dad. Her dad's going to give a little homily. 
and blah, blah, blah. And I said to her, so what did you think after the Mass? What, what was it like? She goes, you look ridiculous in those clothes. <laughs> That's what you got out of this? <laughs> so I've been working on her. <laughs> so I figured I would go in with this It's a Wonderful Life thing, see how we do with that. But I found, I found myself saying, you see, we always talk about like Good Shepherd and what it's all about and want you to come. I said, like, but that movie perfectly describes what we always talk about at Good Shepherd. And I thought to myself, maybe that's why It's a Wonderful Life is such a powerful movie in all of our lives. Is there anybody here who hasn't seen it? Okay. You must see. It's like 97% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's really good. Uh, that why does that pull us in? Because George Bailey enters the kingdom of heaven when he goes back into that house. The kingdom of heaven is a shift in our consciousness. It's a shift in our awareness. <coughs> and suddenly, life is never the same again for George Bailey. The kingdom of heaven. This dimension of being that is available to every one of us right here. But you know, it was funny because Rachel said, she goes, you know, when you think about it, she goes, first of all, she goes, <clears throat> I guess we're all George Bailey. What? <laughs> she goes, yeah. She goes, I, don't, I never really think about, you know, friends that I have. She's got a couple of kids that don't have a lot of friends. And she's very friendly with them. She goes, I wonder how, what does my friendship mean to them and, and am I impacting on their life? She's never really thought about that. And it was funny because I'm thinking like, yeah, we're all George Bailey. I, I'm so busy trying to talk to you about It's a Wonderful Life that I'm not getting that right now I'm in It's a Wonderful Life. I'm in the Kingdom of Heaven. I'm talking to my daughter at this restaurant. I'm already in it. Stop talking about it and be in it. But she made a good point. She said, you know, you, when you think about it, it almost looked like he was still a little bothered. He wasn't like totally reconciled to being George Bailey, building and loan, you know, giving out homes to them. Um, martini and being there for everybody, you know, being the guy that everybody liked and admired. There's always maybe something a little bothering him, right? Remember the banister, the little thing? Oh, I got throw this. And then he's in the kingdom of heaven, he's kissing it. It's beautiful. I thought, well, that's an interesting point. Like, that something was maybe still bothering him. <coughs> and he needed this crisis. He needed this setback, this heartache, this difficulty to transform him. Without losing the eight grand, George Bailey keeps walking around half awake. He needed that disaster, that crisis, to awaken and enlighten him into the kingdom of heaven. And I thought, you know, that's a good point, you know, when you think about sometimes when we get our heart broken or somebody hurts us, right, and we, and we forgive, are there things that kind of maybe could block this kingdom of heaven experience that Jesus talked about? And I remember a, a while ago telling you the story about my chalice. Now, I was ordained a priest in 87, and my parents gave me this chalice. And the chalice says, um, you know, ordained uh, November 21st, 1987. Love always, mom and dad. And then when I left the priesthood, the love always, mom and dad, we want that back. <laughs> you want it back. Yeah, you're not going to use it. I'm gonna, we're going to give it to some 
some priest in Vietnam or Guatemala or some third world country where they could really use it. So, well, I don't want to keep something that was a gift that you want back. So I'll never forget that day seeing my father probably doing my mother's bidding. <laughs> <laughs> Walking with this thing, this case. <laughs> and uh, I was like, ah! It's just a thing. Big deal. I don't know, I'm 32, 33 years old. So what? Although there was a part of me thinking, you know what? Maybe I'm going to go back to the priesthood and I'm going to get my own chalice. <laughs> I'm going to the, I'm gonna go back to the priesthood just to get my own chalice. I <laughs> need your stinking chalice. <laughs> but anyway, so then like I had told you that, so 25 years later, my sister calls me up and tells me, you're not going to believe this, but I found your chalice. I said, oh, so she never sent it to Vietnam or Guatemala. It was always in the closet underneath the stairs for 25 years. But I remember getting it, getting it back and telling you that story and using it again. And I was like, wow, I got so emotional. I didn't realize how much I was hurt. Now believe me, I love my mother and father. If I could pick two people to be my mother and father, it would be Richie and Dolores. I'm so lucky that they are my mother and father. But we're all human beings. But I didn't know how much this hurt me. And I thought, how about all of us? There's the psychological hurt, there's a difficulty, there's a heartache, there's a loss. Where are we with that? Have we forgiven? Have we really let go? You know, we love to like blow through the Our Father, la 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 la, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them. It's so nice, isn't it? <laughs> forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Wait a minute. <laughs> no question about it, and it's so hard to do. But we are called by Christ to forgive. To forgive and to let go. How are you doing with all that? To really forgive and really let it go. You know? George Bailey is asked to forgive Potter. What? And you know, to see like the bigger picture of things. I mean, let's face it, we live our lives with the human condition of confusion. Things happen. There's problems in our life. I remember uh, that story of the woman. She was a doctor and she was pronounced clinically dead. And during this period, she said she had this overwhelming experience of wanting to forgive or being able to forgive those who hurt her, and she was really hurt in so many ways. And yet somehow she had a shift in the way she saw those people, and she was totally able to forgive them and had compassion for them. And she said, she says, I remember almost like not wanting to come back, but I did. Do you know that five years later after that experience, her son was killed? And she said, you know, obviously it broke my heart. Obviously I grieve the loss of my son. But I live knowing absolutely that he is in this place of absolute ecstasy and joy and vibrancy of life. You know, it's almost like what's going to happen to us is when we leave our bodies, we're going we're gonna to look back and go, oh my gosh, I didn't know that was going on. I didn't know why that person did that. And now it all kind of comes together for me. And I understand that. 
to see the bigger picture of our life, get an aerial view of our life, where what we can often do is we live in the meat and potatoes of our life, then, in, and now, and we need to also see a bigger picture. Here's a great line. God is always ready to give you so much more than he's asking you to let go of. God is always willing and ready to give you so much more than you're ever going to be asked to let go of it. We have to let go. We have to forgive. Even in the midst of the mystery of understanding some of the pain that we feel with losses. To somehow trust that there is this overriding dynamic going on in our life. In life. I use that example of um, One Strange Rock. It was on Netflix where this sandstorm goes up, it takes millions of tons of sand, it goes over to Brazil. That sand is a perfect fertilizer for trees and plant life. The plants and the trees grow. They suck oxygen up the top of the tree to the leaves, which then vaporizes. And the largest, vape, the largest river on Earth is a vaporous river that then sends water and oxygen to another part of the earth that is deficient in water and oxygen. What? Like, to me, what is going on there? In other words, I love that example because it, to me it's like, that's the dynamic of God. Like, things that don't make any sense, the heartaches that we have to deal with, somehow or another... God is going to make that all right. The healing and the love is so much more powerful than the hurt. God is always willing to give us so much more than he's asking us to let go of. We've got to let it go. I really think that when those disciples... Where do you live? I think they discovered that Jesus didn't live on 515 Nazareth Way. <laughs> they came to discover that Jesus lived in a state of being. Jesus lived in a state of being of this God consciousness and he knew he was one with the source of his life. He knew that the strength and the healing power was available to him all the time. And probably what makes Jesus unique to all of us, Jesus never left the kingdom of heaven. He lived in it all the time. Now a lot of times what we do is we kind of stick our toe in that kingdom of heaven. and like, oh, i got to go back. i got to go back to my problems and my worries and the heartaches and this and that. You just say, no. Let go of that. And step into that kingdom. And I'm, I, this is real. I'm not just blabbing away here. <clears throat> a state of being. A state of consciousness. A shift in the way we experience life. Just like George Bailey. That's available to us. And it seems like it comes when we let go of those hurts and trust, let go and let God come out of ourselves in the small little gestures of love. Like Zuzu's petals. Like listening to his son, how do you spell Frankenstein? Small little acts of love. And every time we do that, we experience being in the kingdom of heaven.